Twitter says no to political advertising. The social media platform imposes a ban ahead of next year's US presidential election. But how will this be enforced? And would it encourage or stifle political debate? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Nastasia Tay. Now, social media has transformed the way we debate politics, and no one knows that more than the President of the United States, Donald Trump, who often uses Twitter to announce new policies, attack opponents, or even retweet what many consider to be misleading information. And over the years, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube have been criticized for allowing political hate speech and misinformation to flourish on their platforms. Now, with just a year to go before the US presidential election, Twitter is banning all political advertising around the world from next month. While some Democratic candidates welcomed the move, President Trump's campaign manager called it a very dumb decision intended to silence conservatives. Well, Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey says, this isn't about free expression. This is about paying for reach. And paying to increase the reach of political speech has significant ramifications that today's democratic infrastructure may not be prepared to handle. It's worth stepping back in order to address. Well, let's take a closer look at spending around social media ads in the United States. Now, political parties are expected to spend $6 billion ahead of next year's presidential election. But only about 20% of that will cover digital media. Most of the rest will go to television. Now, Twitter estimates that it earned $3 million from political ads during last year's midterm election. Now, that's not a huge amount. Democratic presidential candidate Kamala Harris has spent more than a million dollars on Twitter ads since last June. To put that into perspective, President Trump has spent less than $7,000. His campaign is more focused on Facebook, spending more than $21 million there. And Facebook says political advertising will account for about 0.5% of its revenue next year. Well, let's introduce today's panel. Joining us from the eastern Dutch city of Enschede, Philip Bray. He's a professor in philosophy at the University of Twente and an analyst on the philosophy of technology. In Philadelphia, that's Joe Watkins, a Republican political strategist. And also on Skype from Essex in the UK, that's Yaya Cohen, who's an analyst on internet law and social media. Welcome to you all. Right, so to begin with, I think it's important to define what we see political advertising as being. So Jack Dorsey here is referring specifically to promoted tweets, so tweets that companies would then pay for when people engage with them. Um, but it isn't just tweets that promote candidates that he's wanting to ban, it's also issue advertising as well. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to start with you because that sounds very tricky. Where do you draw the line there? I think you, you draw the line, um, it, 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 the, 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 the very, the very, okay. We need to go back to basics. We need to look at the mission statement of each of these organizations. So when you look at the mission statement, say, of Twitter, uh, it is really to give everyone the power to create and share ideas and information instantly without barriers. In Twitter's view, uh, paid political adverts uh, could possibly create barriers to free speech. And also, they are not instantaneous. They are not a media. They are, they are f uh, a speech that has been planned. And what Twitter is saying is if we are allowed this, uh, this information uh, to disseminate via uh, paid advertising, it means that we are uh, doing injustice to our own mission statement. So this is where we draw the line where we know that the, 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 uh, the activity goes against what we believe in. Well, let me throw this to you, Philip, because um, I, I want to dig into this idea of issue advertisements, right? So it's not just ads around candidates, but it's ads around issues. Um, so any kind of promoted ad around a topic could potentially be banned here. Um, what's your take on that, Philip? Well, I mean, Twitter and other social media um, they promote uh, all kinds of speech, uh, including uh, political speech. And uh, political advertising is a form of, uh, uh, of speech. Um, these companies also allow other forms of advertising. So why not uh, political advertising? It's a form of speech that, in my view, should be protected, especially on these large 
social media platforms that are used by millions, even billions of users. Okay, so I, I feel like we're, we're heading each other off here in terms of what is free speech. So what we're also talking about is, is paid speech. So at what point do, well, is paid spe speech free speech? Let me ask you that question, Joe. Uh, well, um, I I've been uh, a candidate myself uh, for political office. I've worked for a U.S. senator, and I worked in his campaign for the U.S. Senate, and he won. And I worked, in the, I worked in a presidential campaign. I've worked in a couple. And the, pres the first one I worked on, the president, the candidate won and won the presidency and served in the White House. And I worked in his White House staff. Uh, I, I know the power of words, and, and I know the, the importance of freedom of information. Um, I, I think that Twitter is probably trying to, um, trying to uh, stop the flow of disinformation uh, that many felt uh, had an impact in the 20. 16 uh, presidential campaign. So I think this is a move to try to stop the flow of disinformation from, uh, from outside parties. Uh, but I'm not sure that it'll have the consequence, uh, the, uh, the desired effect, that is. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, President Trump uses Twitter um, not for polit paid political ads. And you can see from how much, how little he spends, he's probably not ever going to spend very much on political ads with Twitter. But uh, he uses Twitter as a way to get information to millions of people in a matter of moments. Uh, and he's been very, very successful with it. And that won't stop. He'll continue to use it. He'll continue to uh, dominate that platform and to, uh, to move markets and also to move people uh, using the Twitter platform. Uh, however, uh, Twitter will take a, a mm. small hit in terms of its uh, uh, unwillingness to, to pay for these, uh, to allow for these paid ads, because it'll, it'll impact their, their balance sheet. But not much, but a little bit. Mm. And uh, at the end of the day, it won't really disrupt much. Joe, I'm going to come back to the numbers in just a moment, but I want to pick up on one of the things that you said there, because this refers to paid tweets, right? So, um, as you said, President Trump can continue tweeting on his, and on his own account if these aren't promoted tweets, and he has, I believe, something at the moment, 66.4 million followers. And Twitter was his primary vehicle for communication in the lead-up to the last election. So, Despite the fact that this move does potentially favor incumbents, right? So Jack Dorsey has already said this. The Trump campaign has said that it's dumb. And then we've had mostly positive reactions from the Democratic side. So I'm curious, break that down for us, Joe. How, how will this affect campaigns um, leading up to the 2020 election? Well, campaigns spend money on these political ads, these paid political ads to influence people. And uh, oftentimes, uh, the, the, uh, the ads that they pay for are meant to, um, meant to um, cast their opponents in an unfavorable light. Uh, so these are very, very important, uh, to, uh, a very important tool for campaigns. Uh, they want to define their opponents before the opponents have a chance to define themselves, and they want to define their opponents in a negative way. And so that's how people in, in campaigns use paid political advertising. Uh, in, in this case, um, uh, the, the, the Trump campaign would probably think this is uh, uh, obviously trying to, to slow them down, slow down the people who would, on their behalf, pay for these ads on Twitter. And so that's why the Trump campaign wouldn't like it. But uh, on the other hand, it's not going to slow the president down from being able to get his message out on Twitter uh, mm -hmm. to uh, millions of Americans uh, uh, across the United States and also people around the world. Well, so one of the arguments against doing this ban is, is related to this, because th we've heard also from civil society groups that it could, um, it could damage people who aren't necessarily in the media spotlight, so lessen the voices of, of smaller candidates, perhaps, or, or affect the voices of other yeah, advocacy right. groups, right? So I know Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook, who doesn't agree with this, he's said that ads are an important part of voice. Um, who does this hurt the most, Philip? Well, it, it hurts, um, most of all, it hurts political discourse and it hurts democracy because uh, for a well-functioning democracy, you need political speech and that uh, includes paid uh, political speech. And uh, it's, it's very unfortunate to have this ban because it also affects... The reason that uh, Jack Dorsey wants this is he says... There's so much false and misleading information out there in political advertising. Uh, and he says it challenges civic discourse and democratic infrastructures. So that may all be true, but by banning all political uh, advertising as a result, including uh, the ones that are not false and misleading, you're throwing out the child with the bathwater. 
and you're still allowing um, the, the unpaid uh, false and misleading speech. So you, you, you are still having that problem. Now, what, what Mark Zuckerberg is proposing to just um, keep uh, airing these uh, political ads uh, with no interference, whether they're uh, misleading uh, or false or not, is also completely the wrong approach because then you reward misinformation campaigns and uh, have the negative consequences that J Jack Dorsey warns about. So we need to find a middle ground between mm. banning all political ads and just allowing all political ads. Yeah, I want to ask you to respond to what Philip was just saying there. Is this throwing the baby out with the bathwater or is this a protection of free speech? I think there is a fundamental uh, difference between free speech and paid speech. These two uh, things are not the same. Uh, free speech means that uh, speech is free for everyone, so everyone uh, can 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 uh, express themselves uh, in a way which is equal. Uh, and whoever wants to listen to the speech can listen to the speech. Whoever doesn't want to listen to the speech does not have to listen to speech. With with paid speech, paid advertising means that. Uh, first, uh, people who are, who are able to afford uh, to pay for, for more advertising, their voice will be heard louder. But also, it means that we are forcing uh, speech upon people who might not necessarily want to hear that speech. Uh, so, so it is okay if, if you're a follower of, of, of an individual, whether it is the United States state president or anybody else, mm -hmm. and you're willing to hear what they have to say, or if you really don't want to hear that kind of stuff, but it is forced upon you uh, because uh, th that individual had paid for advertising. So, so I think that, that the, the uh, simplicity of, of the phrase free speech uh, need to be looked at in a little bit more detail here. Well, yeah, yeah. speaking of paid speech, I want to look at some of these figures. Um, so I, I know there are some discrepancies about reporting and who's spent what and where um, and what's classified as political ads. But let's take some numbers here from the US Federal Election Commission. And it says since 2008, um, and that's really the birth of social media in terms of political campaigning, campaigns have spent something like $46 million on Facebook, $30 million on Google, and they've spent less than $2 million on Twitter. So we're really not talking about huge amounts of cash here for Twitter. So is this, and I'm going to ask this question to Joe, is this rather a savvy strategic business decision on the part of Twitter to set itself apart from Facebook? Uh, it may be. It may be a savvy, um, it may be meant to be a savvy business decision on the part of Twitter to set themselves apart from Facebook. But at the end of the day, it, uh, like I said earlier, it may not have the desired uh, um, uh, end. Uh, and, and that is because, again, when you consider what political advertising is, if you're a candidate, and this is, this is why it favors incumbents and it, it disfavors uh, people who are new to the process. If I'm a, a brand new candidate running for the United States Senate in the United States, and I want to uh, tell people about myself so they know who I am so they can vote for me, um, I have to buy paid political advertising to do that. I've got to buy an ad that says, I'm Joe Watkins, this is where I'm from, this is what I've done, and this is why you need to vote for me. And to not be able to do that, just uh, it favors the incumbent, it favors the person who's already there. Uh, and uh, they don't have to do anything more because they're already there, they already have a record, and people already know who they are. But for me, as a new person, and people, who, and people don't know who I am, it, it puts me at a distinct disadvantage. And so uh, it doesn't have the, 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 the consequence, the, in, the intended end that uh, Twitter might be uh, aiming for. If they're aiming to, to, to uh, kind of do away or discourage disinformation or misinformation, uh, it, it, it probably won't get that done. And it certainly won't allow for a leveling of the playing field with regards to candidates. Well, I suspect this wasn't just about misinformation when, for Twitter. It, it also potentially was about trying to set itself apart within the social media sphere. And I see that the timing of all of this announcement, it came literally as Mark Zuckerberg was announcing some pretty good earnings data for Facebook. And I, I, that doesn't seem to be much of a coincidence. So I, I do want to play you something here because Mark Zuckerberg has been under fire for allowing political advertisements with misinformation to continue existing on Facebook, right? But Last week, he did give a speech at Georgetown. Let's have a listen to what he said. We're at another crossroads. We can either continue to stand for free expression, understanding its messiness, but believing that the long journey towards greater progress requires confronting ideas that challenge us. Or 
we can decide that the cost is simply too great. I don't think it's right for a private company to censor politicians or the news in a democracy. And we are not an outlier here. You know, the other major internet platforms and the vast majority of media also run these same ads. So, Philip, I'm going to ask you to respond to that. Presumably, you do agree with Zuckerberg there. Well, I, I agree with the sentiment, but uh, with the decision to allow for that free speech com also comes responsibility. And I think that both Twitter and Facebook are abdicating that responsibility. Uh, uh, Twitter, by simply banning all uh, uh, political advertising, including the ones that are not based on misinformation, and um, uh, Facebook by allowing advertising that is uh, false and misleading. Uh, real responsibility in this matter for social media companies would be to actually be, uh, function as a genuine arbiter in that respect. They have to do fact-checking and allow those political advertisements uh, that are uh, accurate and uh, disallow those that are uh, part of a disinformation campaign. Well, let's and they can do then. so. They can do so with uh, through um, nonpartisan fact-checking organizations. Okay, because I do want to talk on, about enforcement of all of this, right? Because even with this ban, I imagine you could pay influencers who have lots of followers on Twitter to, to tweet and engage with people online um, without necessarily using these promoted tweets. And we also know that there's these, this large network of bots, right, on, on Twitter. Do, could we then perhaps see a resurgence of those? Let me throw that to you, Yaya. I think I think the, the the problem for for Mr. Zuckerberg first is is that if Facebook uh, is taking an approach where it does censor uh, certain accounts and it does certain certain voices, then it cannot then turn around and say, well, we 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 will be uh, censored and do do fact checking, but we will exclude from this process politicians only, mm -hmm. because there are other po political ideas and other political values that are not necessarily being promoted by people who call themselves politicians. Uh, and I think this is where, where where the real problem is. So so you have to choose either or. Either we are going to get engaged in censorship and fact checking, and then decide who we're going to ban, who we're going to not ban. Or we want nothing to do with it. Uh, we will just allow people to say whatever they want to say. Everyone is equal, and then let uh, the people judge who they believe, and and let them make up their own mind because people aren't stupid. And I think that Twitter is taking the approach of trusting the people to make the right decision. So people quite often are able to recognize whether there is a bot involved, whether they become a subject of a campaign. Mm. People are quite smart, and they don't really need Facebook to tell them uh, mm. what they what they they need to listen to and what they don't need to listen to. Well, then let me ask you a little more about the protection Studies. of people's information, right? Oh, okay. <laughs> let me ask you to respond to that then, Philip. You're having a, you're shaking your well, head. There. I just want to say that this is not what empirical studies show. Uh, studies show that people are often not able to recognize uh, fake news and even um, often assign more credibility to fake news that is well crafted. Mm -hmm than to real news. So I think there is a real problem that people cannot often recognize this fake information. And this goes to the heart of the matter. It's not about uh, paid uh, political speech or unpaid speech. It's about how to deal with uh, massive amounts of false and misleading political speech on social media platforms. And my answer to that is the only solution is that social media companies, they don't do bans of all speech. They don't uh, allow all speech, they have to be arbiters through fact-checking. That's that's the only solution. Well, picking up on that, just think, today, that... Facebook suspended three accounts linked to Russian interference that were involved in um, trying to influence voters in African countries. So, I mean, that is definitely an, an ongoing trend that we see. Sorry, Aya, pl please do jump in there. Uh... I think there is something uh, slightly patronizing about about this approach that uh, Big Brother knows best and, and people aren't as clever as we think they are. And, and although I accept that there are some studies, uh, I, I, I sometimes doubt uh, uh, the, the, the conclusions and the way those studies have been conducted and who's been paying for mm. those studies and, and for that research. And I think in, in, in democracy, at least, we have to give people the credit they deserve. We cannot possibly 
place uh, an organization such as Facebook or any other corporate body to make decisions for the people. I trust the people. Uh, and I think that we all have a lot of faith in the people. People aren't as stupid as some people uh, think they are. Um, I, 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 think, I, think, I think the public tends to come to the right decision. And then for someone to turn around and say, well, they only came to this conclusion because they, they, they've been, they've not been clever enough, they've been uh, unduly influenced by bots or by robots or by some, some political campaigning which, which has been uh, go, gone wrong. I, th I think there's something slightly patronizing mm. about this approach and I don't, I, I don't really accept that. I don't, I don't that. think it's patronizing. I, I think it's normal. I mean, we, we ask the same of the, the labeling of products that they don't contain false information about the number of calories or the chemical ingredients and you kind of have the same request of political advertising. I think it's a normal thing. Well, so let me throw it's this idea out here it because there, there has been this suggestion because we already see that promoted tweets, some of them, um, are targeted at, at specific people, right? So Twitter's used its algorithms and worked out where these, who should see these tweets. Um, and some are arguing that companies should focus on restricting the use of personal data in the targeting of these ads rather than banning all ads entirely. Um, Joe, do you think there's any value in that? Well, um, maybe there's some value in it. Um, I, I think that, uh, you know, the, the issue becomes is uh, to what degree sh uh, should these companies uh, police uh, the, 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 the ads that, uh, uh, that they get paid to, uh, to put on their, on their platforms? And, um, and that, that's a question that I think will be answered in time. Um, uh, a lot of the advertising uh, now is very sophisticated. Uh, mm. It's extraordinarily sophisticated. Uh, so while it may have the outward appearance of being very simple and straightforward, uh, the, the, many of these ads are highly sophisticated to reach uh, a particular um, audience and to move an audience in, in one direction or another. So uh, this is all very hard stuff. You know, at what, at what point do you stifle freedom of speech uh, in, in, in favor of, uh, of, of, uh, st of stopping the spread of false information? Um, uh, I don't know that you can actually do that, I, and, and I think that Zuckerberg is, is uh, probably errs on the on the right side of this by saying, you know what, we're gonna we're gonna allow these ads on our platform and uh, let the chips fall where they may. At least people can be heard. Uh, the good people, along with maybe the people who don't have good intentions, can be heard, and uh, we'll leave it to the consumer to, to to kind of figure it out. Maybe there's a need for some more policing on their part, but it's awfully hard to police. I mean, how do you police if I'm a candidate? Running. If you've got a hundred candidates running for office, how do you how do you police what's being said about them? If somebody makes an accusation that I did something, hmm. how do, how does how does any company any uh, social platform police that? It becomes very very difficult, very very nitpicky, uh, and, and and very very hard to arrive at what the truth is. Absolutely. I'm I'm going to throw a last very quick question to you, Philip, because we are running out of time. Do you think that this ban? potentially encourages political debate, or does it stifle it? Um, it, it could... Well, I, I don't think it has a, a big um, implication for, for the normal use of Twitter, of course, which also includes mm. political discourse. So at, at least it doesn't ban uh, political discourse on Twitter, uh, which is a good thing, of course. It, it bans some form of it, which I think I don't agree with. Um, instead of having the ban, you, you want to have a, all the messiness that the policing brings. And I agree that it's, it's, a, it's a messy thing to do, but the alternatives to either ban speech or allow any speech, how, however false and misleading the, uh, the campaign is, mm. uh, those are not the answers. Well, what it has done, it has certainly encouraged um, an interesting political debate amongst us today. Thank you all for joining us. Thanks to all our guests, Philip Bray, Joe Watkins, and Yair Cohen for being with us today on Inside Story. And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, do go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can also join the conversation actually on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Nastasia Tay, and the entire team here in Doha, bye for now.